Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back for another White House Conversation. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be uh, talking about um, the future of aviation technology in the United States, and we have a, a wonderful uh, set of guests to help us talk that through. Uh, as I've said uh, before on this channel, uh, we believe that uh, under the President's leadership, the United States has continued to be one of the world's most innovative uh, countries and economies, uh, a country that's developing industries of the future and harnessing science and technology in order to address important challenges. And I think today we have an opportunity uh, on uh, the future of aviation technology to do just that. Later in this week up in Pittsburgh on Thursday at the Frontiers Conference, we'll have a full day including the President and a number of other guests uh, where they imagine uh, the nation and the world in 50 years and beyond and to celebrate the science and technology uh, and innovation across a broad set of issue areas that will shape that future. So I, I, hope, I sure hope people will uh, tune in for that. Um, today we're, we have a uh, great panel to help us work through questions, as I said, around the future of aviation technology. And just working uh, from your right uh, across the screen, I want to introduce first Eric Allison, who's the CEO of uh, Z Aero, a personal aircraft company, and uh, his sensibility, wisdom, and even uh, headedness uh, springs from the fact that he uh, is also from Minnesota. Um, so if he seems reasonable and very even handed, you'll know why. Um, next to him is Helen uh, Grainer, who's the CTO and co founder of uh, Sci Fi Works a company that develops small multi-rotor drones um, for consumer and military markets. Uh, before uh, that, she worked at iRobot, where among other things, um, they developed the Roomba technology, a technology that uh, my wife and I use at home quite, uh, quite a bit. Uh, and then on my right is obviously Secretary Fox, who is uh, not only uh, very effective transportation secretary, but as I've said to him and as the president said to him, I think, is effectively helping us shape the future economy uh, in a number of ways, um, and I think has done so in a way that really stands out in our cabinet over the last several months in two big ways, which is one is on automated vehicles, uh, and then the second is on the topic that we're going to discuss today, which is, uh, as they say, the future of aviation technology. Before I do that, I just want to underscore what an impact uh, Anthony is having uh, on this as a result of the recent rule published on uh, unmanned aerial systems integration. And this is a rule that which, for the first time, will enable the widespread non-recreational uh, flight of small drones under 35 pounds in the U.S. airspace. And just as an indication of how big this opportunity is and then what's happening, we assess that uh, this market could generate $82 billion for the U.S. economy and create more than 100,000 new jobs in the next 10 years. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But in the short period since we've had this rule in place, 7,500 Americans have successfully passed the remote pilot knowledge test offered by the FAA and have become certified uh, UAS or uh, unmanned aerial system pilots, which I think is an early indication of the success of the rule not only success of the rule, but the interest in the economy for uh, this opportunity. So let me just start at the top, and I'll just, uh, Eric, I'll start with you. If you, maybe you and Helen paint a picture for us about what is this technology, uh, what are the opportunities that it presents, and um, what should, what can the American people anticipate about what uh, this new technology uh, gives uh, them opportunity for? Well, first of all, thank you, Dennis, for inviting us to be here with you today. This is uh, a great opportunity to, to talk about something that's really important, um, which is the future of aviation. In, in my mind, flight has been this, uh, this idea that's fascinated people kind of from time immemorial, that from the early legends of Icarus to um, people strapping wings on and trying to fly like birds to the, the revolution in aviation that the Wright brothers started that's kind of ongoing today. Um, people have wanted to fly. It's maybe the most coveted of the superpowers, shall we say. That, um, <laughs> but the, I think that where we're at right now is kind of at a cusp, like a tipping point of a new revolution in aviation because the technology that 
uh, fueled information revolution that allows us to broadcast this live on Facebook right now is moving over to physical objects. It's moving into things like drones. And that's a kind of a, the drones are a, or the UAS are a harbinger of this, that this technology is just going to grow. It's become more developed. And it actually has the potential to uh, allow us to reimagine personal aircraft uh, in a way that brings more utility, more safety, and more, uh, more accessibility to, to, these, uh, to these vehicles. But what we have to do is kind of on the ground floor here, while we're at this cusp of, of uh, this really becoming a huge industry, to build these regulatory partnerships to kind of be able to, to bring these products to market in an effective way. That's good. So um, Helen, tell us a little bit about what you, anything you want to uh, pile on uh, in terms of those opening remarks, but also what do you think the future looks like if we handle this technology correctly, if we create the kind of opportunities that um, this opportunity presents? What, what does the future look like? Well, I'm really excited about uh, the drone industry. Um, there's almost not a physical industry that is not examining and implementing drones in their, um, in their business. For example, it's, uh, uh, it's transport, it's uh, mining, it's construction, it's agriculture. Um, there's almost insurance, um, almost all the f industries that have a physical component to them are looking at drones as a way to be more efficient and more effective. So I believe that drones um, will be doing uh, everything in the future from insurance inspection to uh, construction oversight and topological mapping. Uh, I do believe in drone delivery. Uh, we recently run tests with uh, UPS to do deliveries to an inaccessible island off the coast of um, Massachusetts. So I believe drones will be delivering everything, not just your packages, but maybe that hot dinner, that Starbucks coffee, uh, things you want really quickly. Uh, and you know maybe even some of your groceries, if you forgot something like milk and you don't want to run back out to the grocery store. So I think this will have a huge impact on people's lives. <laughs> Anthony, you, you've heard uh, the kind of opening comments here, um, and Helen's just, I think, made a compelling case about convenience, although this, this project that you ran out to uh, the island off of uh, Massachusetts, I think was delivering even prescription medicines yes, or something. Yes. So aside from convenience, what, what else, and as you've been working this, what are the other kinds of opportunities that you see this technology unlocking? Well, I think another significant opportunity with drones is uh, helping us with some of our natural disasters, uh, whether they are wildfires or uh, floods or things like that. Uh, we, we actually have uh, 12,000 accidents every single year among utility workers, and the possibility that drones could go and do some of the That's more dangerous uh, work that we, uh, we typically reserve for human beings offers us a chance to improve safety in a, in a dramatic way as well. That's interesting. Convenience, safety, um, new opportunity, you know, striking people's imagination, the new Icarus. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what, as policymakers, what, what should we here be worried about in terms of either enabling uh, the development of this technology or stifling mm -hmm. it? Um, what do you see as, both as we uh, finish our time here and as the next administration, whoever that may be, comes in? What, what are the risks uh, to the development of the technology from a public policy standpoint? Well, I think that um, regulations have to be right-sized. They can't be you know, entirely free-for-all, and they can't be so restrictive that you're not allowed to fly a drone at all. Um, you know, right now, the FAA just came out with the Port 107, as, as was mentioned, which allowed commercial operators, without going through the rigmarole of uh, getting exemptions to rules, to be able to fly commercially. And that's really helped the industry, right? Because um, they're able to go every day and do work with drones. And, uh, you know, as a roboticist, the word robot means to do work. So we want them out there doing work for people. Um, we just ran a, uh, actually a Department of Transportation pilot um, monitoring traffic with the drones. You know, so we have a persistent drone um, that from a bird's eye view, it can monitor traffic for several hours and that helped with both traffic management but also emergency response, getting emergency workers to the right place at the right time. It's just 
Um, so many applications that we're able to do today because of the opening of the regulations, and now I think the industry is believes that we need to push it forward, but we need to do so by proving to the FAA and the Department of Transportation that we can do it safely and we can do it effectively and we can um, uh, you know, get the drones out there to more and more applications by taking on things that are not yet allowed, like operations at night, non-line of sight operations. That's interesting. Eric, you've seen a lot of technology develop. Um, you know, you've been in Silicon Valley now for almost two decades. Um, are there analogous um, technologies or developments of technology that give you either warning signs about what we should be doing as public policymakers, um, or maybe plot out a, a useful path by which we can make sure that, as I think as Helen is saying, that we're finding the Goldilocks here. We're not too regulative, but we're also uh, regulative enough to underscore things like safety uh, as well as convenience. Right. Yeah, I think that, that that's that's exactly right, and I think that the it's really evident of the kind of ethic of innovation that you guys have tried to embed into the government that we're having this conversation at all. I think it's really important, and and the Part 107 uh, final rule being published that you mentioned, uh, the NHTSA guidelines on on AVs that um, that came out a couple weeks ago, I think, is also part of that and actually fits into this picture um, if you kind of look at it broadly enough. Um, and I think also the, the, the ongoing effort to restructure the small aircraft certification uh, guidelines, the, the Part 23 rewrite, so to speak, um, I think is another important picture of this. It, it starts to, these things fit together um, in terms of ch shifting the regulatory mindset from one of kind of narrow prescriptive regulations to a broader set of regulations that let you, let the regulators kind of help work with the industry to say yes yeah. on things. And I think that's, that's really important. That's useful. Anthony, how, how do you stack this up, right? When, you're, when you go through the rulemaking, uh, be that here on the U, UAS or as Eric has just alluded to on the automated, automated vehicles, how do, how do you find the right balance between safety and convenience, uh, between you know, opportunity and, and threat? Um, what's, a, what's a helpful way to think about that? Uh, well, Dennis, I think an important contextual piece here is that for most of the 50 years in the U.S. Department of Transportation, we've been regulating mature transportation technologies. And so there was a, an ability to be prescriptive about how you regulate those mature technologies that you don't have in some of these emerging areas. So our approach has to be more proactive. We have to think in terms not so much um, can you or can't you, but how? And we have to build safety culture into the very ground floor of these technologies as they come about. It's a little bit of a challenge, though, because um, most of our authorities are reactive in nature. And so when we try to become more pre proactive, we're sometimes doing it in ways that some of our traditional stakeholders will say, wait a second, you guys aren't mandating something. You're, you're, you're putting a voluntary framework in place, but that's the point is that we're trying to get ahead of it and try to build a safety culture in from the ground floor. That makes sense. That makes sense. As we are, um, you know, Helen, maybe I start with you on this one again too. Um, as, as you look in terms of either competitors in the space, or just as you've, you know, had quite a career of technology development too. Is there, is there a competitive aspect to this that, you know, as well as making sure that we're regulating for safety, we're also regulating for enough innovation that we're not letting somebody else catch up to us. I don't know who that would be, but uh, tell us a little bit about the global competition in this space. How worried should we be about that? What are the relative benefits that we bring to that uh, competition? What are the drawbacks that we should be mindful of? Well, it, in, in the past, it has been tough. I knew drone companies in the 90s, and most of them were out of business because they could not get permission to fly commercially. And That's that has driven some of the industry overseas. And some of the large companies, like Google and Amazon, actually went to test drones. But because of where the FAA has come out on Part 107 and the ongoing, we're staying in this country. And as I mentioned, we just did try, uh, tests with UPS to deliver medical equipment to Ireland off the coast of Massachusetts. We're doing it right here in this country, because when you do it in this country, you create the industry here, you create jobs here, and you um, have that 
wonderful cycle of innovation that will come out with the next latest and greatest thing. Yeah. So is that, uh, as, a, as somebody who's trying to innovate in this space, um, we seem to be coming up with a, an appropriate regulatory framework. Are there other risks to the development of the technology? What are they? Are they finding the right people? Are they, is it just, you know, finding the, the right mix of patience and, you know, urgency? What, what's the... Yeah, I, I think that, that from, from my perspective, I mean, in any, from any company's perspective, I think in a highly regulated industry, regulatory uncertainty is kind of the number one risk, and it's probably the number two risk, too, frankly, that it's, it's, it's a big deal. That's interesting. And, um, and, I, and I think that at the same time, I totally understand that from the safety regulator's standpoint, it's a really hard problem, right, because there's a mandate to ensure safety. I'd argue that there's a, or suggest perhaps, that there's a, uh, a perspective on ensuring safety and promoting innovation that should also be in there because I think promoting innovation ultimately results in more safety. And I think that that's really important from the, from the safety perspective to realize yeah. that. The, and, and I mean, I, I, it's an imperfect analogy, but I think of I have a one-year-old daughter and um, my wife and I talk all the time about how we set boundaries for her as she's growing up. And I think that that's kind of a, a similar perspective, perhaps, in regulation, that you have to set boundaries that are broad enough to allow that ex exploration, innovation, the learning that actually results in safety, essentially, um, without making them too prescriptive, because otherwise you just don't learn. You don't, uh, you don't grow in the, in the right way. So the New York Times had a fascinating story a couple weeks ago about um, this was a different technology, different uh, space, but around the Department of Justice and trying to uh, regulate or litigate in the area of cybercrime. <coughs> Basically, the crux of the story was that absent uh, more uh, capability in the, the government, mm -hmm. that many uh, private um, sector actors were complaining that perhaps we weren't as effective as we should be. I have a different view than that, uh, knowing the unbelievable resource that we have. Um, but how, how do you rack that up, Anthony? You, you specifically said you have to be very careful in light of the fact that this isn't regulating existing technology. This is trying to regulate a vision. Um, how, and you're also not sitting in a building, and I'm not sitting in a building where we have a bunch of people like uh, Helen and Eric who uh, bring this expertise um, or a deep understanding necessarily of their vision and how to realize it. What's the right mix of um, having that technological capacity in-house, being able to go get it in industry or elsewhere, and how do you know that um, you're finding the right balance? I think it's, uh, it's more art than science for sure, and part of it has to do with recognizing what we know and also recognizing what we don't know. Um, there are technologies that are being developed that will come across the transom and our job as an agency is going to be to be ready for that technology to come to us and to have some ideas about how we would evaluate the safety of that technology. And we need to be open to new proof models for safety. We need to be open to what uh, not only industry but our safety advocates do is we get more data and analytics that tell us more about safety than we've known in the past. I'd also say that um, in terms of the workforce at DOT, which is as you were pointing out, we have an incredible workforce in government, um, but there may be competencies that we learn that we need to have in the future that we don't have today. Uh, you know, will DOT at some point need to have an ethicist within DOT? Will we need to have privacy folks? You know, there's all kinds of questions yeah. about that. And what we are doing is basically laying a framework upon which those types of discussions can occur and that evolution can happen organically. So, um, you know, we, we've tried to bring, tried to establish a pipeline really coming out of the, the um, you know, failing that we oversaw as it related to the, the rollout of healthcare.gov. We've tried to basically establish a more aggressive pipeline of talent between the Valley, uh, Austin, Boston, uh, elsewhere into the government. We've got a number of different institutions that allows us to do it. Part of that, uh, part of those institutions, you know, helped us set this up in our Office of Digital Strategies. Um, but the, the question is, as, as you guys innovate in this space, 
what about the human resource, the people that you're, recru you're recruiting, the technologists that you're trying to get? Are we doing a good job of developing that in the, in the country? What, or, uh, and if not, what more should we be doing? Or if so, what's the, what's the secret? Well, I, I, I've always found it's reasonably easy to attract people to build robots and drones. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think it, it goes further. Robots and drones are a great way to inspire children to go into STEM. Um, fields in it's that science, technology, engineering, and math um, studies uh, because kids get excited when they build a robot, right? They they get to put it together, they get to see how it works, they get to debug it and troubleshoot it, and that's um, you know it's a real sense of accomplishment. And at the end of the day, it comes to life. So one of the things I try to do is um, you know go out and speak to kids about building robots and how it's cool. you know. Engineering is not a boring, staid profession. Engineering is an exciting uh, place to invent the future yeah. and uh, also help people. <laughs> yeah, you find the same thing? Or? Absolutely, I think that, that the, the emergence of, of drones over the last what, five to 10 years as such an amazing resource that you can do cool things with has resulted in tens of thousands of people that are interacting with, with devices this way, but with flight too. Yeah. And I think that from an aviation perspective, that's really important as well, that you are introducing, I mean, general aviation is a declining industry, and, but, and all the excitement is on the drone side. And I, I firmly believe that those same technologies, um, I know that they can be put to, to use in personal airplanes. And, um, and that we can, we can create, reimagine essentially aviation for the 21st century. Mildly provocative sentence, even from a Minnesotan, to say the general general aviation <laughs> industry is what, the, what was the word? Uh, it's, 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 no, there's a lot of pilots. The number of pilots is going down, right? Yeah. And so that's just that's just statistics. And um, interesting. But, but the number of people that want to fly, I think, is going up, and that's that's what's important. So tell me this. Uh, you know, we, we could tell you what gets us out of bed every morning. Oftentimes, it's excitement about something. Uh, more often than not, it's fear about something. But uh, what is the most exciting thing that you guys see in terms of the development of the technology uh, that you're working on every day? What's the what's the what's the breakthrough thing that you wanna the aha moment that you're hoping for? Well, I I love innovation, but the end goal of innovation to me is to get the product into users' hands, so having our robots deployed, having, uh, with, with the military, having them do the Department of Transportation pilot, you know, showing the demonstrate the uh, trials of drone delivery, um, you know, getting them into the oil and gas, and getting them to people who need them, that's really what gets me out of bed yeah. every morning. Yeah, yeah. 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 very similar, that I think that's so exciting to be <laughs> at what is the, the tipping point, I think, of kind of this new industry, this kind of uh, reimagining of aviation, and I, I want to, to live in a world, I think, where my, my daughter uh, takes it for granted that you can get food or medicine delivered in minutes um, by a drone. And that, you know, that taking a, taking a trip, a, a short trip in a, in a personal aircraft that's safe and efficient and um, quiet is, is something that's as normal as taking a trip in a car. And I think that's achievable. That's cool. What's the long pole in the tent of that, do you think? What, what is the, like, the one breakthrough that you need? for your daughter to, when she's getting her license, that she's also getting her license for personal aviation. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's regulation, yeah. honestly. I think that this, this is why this is such an important conversation, that, that we have to start with um, this kind of regulatory collaboration between industry and, uh, and the regulators to, to make this happen. I mean, <clears throat> safety is absolutely kind of like the number one important thing. It's, it's at the forefront of everything that we do, engineering, design, testing, safety is so important. But we, we really, I, want, I, I think it's important to realize that there's an equal, equality here, that, that the industry is as interested in safety as the regulators are. Yeah. Because to be successful, we have to do things that are safe. And to, to set this up to actually have products, like Helen said, to be able to you know, can change the world, you can only change the world through products, right? Um, you have to kind of set the ground rules up front here that we can actually innovate in. I think we also, you know, it's at the point where we need to be able to um, fly without worrying about manned aircraft and without them worrying about the, mm -hmm. the, the drones, so deconflicting the airspace, and that has two aspects. 
knowing where everyone's flying and reporting it and being able to see that, but also sense and avoid. Um, if <coughs> something's missed, you're not going to run into it. Now, these technologies are coming extremely fast, so I think it's something that can be done, that companies like MAP.io that are helping by reporting as a centralized system where each aspect is, and so, you know, the hobby drones already have uh, sense and avoid on them. So, um, you know, from a technology point of view, it really is that moment where we can do this and we can make it safe. And it is true that we need to prove to the regulators that it is safe. But um, from a technology point of view, you know, this is um, you know this is where we're going. Every hobby drone right now has sense. Not, not, not everyone, but some. Okay. Do. And that, uh, is that expensive technology? It's it's right now it's it's really good, um, yeah. but it's not long distance enough and not reliable enough to say absolutely it's going to avoid if a crop dust or something comes down right. into the you know where the drones are, are flying. I was going to say the one that my son has. If it has sense and avoid on it, it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth crashing that thing a lot. <laughs> he, he might need a new one. <laughs> Anthony, how many questions did you have in um, your confirmation hearing on, on manned aerial systems, on automated vehicles, or in your courtesy calls with senators? It really wasn't, neither issue was on the map. What, do you, what accounts for, now, now I, I assume this is, I don't know, what is it, 20% of your time, you know, more or less, yeah. but what, what, does that surprise you? Does that, does that, how, and how do you, you know, not in the abstract, but as you know, as concretely as you can say, how, how do you try to compensate for the apparent technological um, gap between what these guys do and what we understand, yeah. and, and what we're in a position to, to yeah. do on our own? It's it's a great question, and you know, Congress in the last FAA authorization did anticipate UAS. They actually directed us to develop a small UAS rule, which is what oh, we've done. Um, but, you know, the reality is, is, is I don't think anyone <laughs> has anticipated the rate of change in transportation when it comes to technology. It's like the mobile phone was 15 years ago. It's all that's coming into transportation so rapidly. My concern has been that while we're moving into the Jetsons era, we have Flintstone uh, approaches to authorities and regulations, and so we can't uh, <laughs> we can't go the distance with this until we really think about things differently. Which is why the small UAS rule is developed to be as flexible and as and as um, open as we can safely. It's why we have a five-year strategy to do more integration of UASs. We have the most complicated airspace in the world because we have a very active commercial and general aviation community and so we do have to work on these deconflicting issues. Uh, with, with the automated vehicle we've set up a framework that I think is going to stand the test of time. I think this is a real watershed moment for autonomous vehicles because now there is a very tangible conversation we can have about the details of how we get from here to there. So um, we're doing everything we can within our authorities but there will come a point where our ability to do it in the executive branch is going to to end and the role of Congress is going to happen. That's interesting. Okay. So I, I was given the, the five minute call about three minutes ago. So this won't be the last question, but I, I, I didn't ask it earlier. So I want to I wanna, um, go back at it. I won't let it be the last question because I don't want to end on this note. But tell me about, you know, the oftentimes people, when they think about UAS, think about uh, privacy invasion. Um, Lack of safety, inability to conflict. What what is it? What do you think is the biggest, not the biggest opportunity as you talked about before, but the biggest risk? And why is it that you think that biggest risk is not one that would be realized? You see what I mean? Like to try to to try to acknowledge that people have concern about UAS. Mm -hmm. Let's not pretend that there's not concern, but try to acknowledge it and then try to give some sense as to why it's a it's a manageable. A manageable risk. So I, I think there is some risk that you know 
people are concerned about privacy. I, I find that you know sometimes people have a larger concern about, about that than safety. They assume these things are going to work well. Yeah. Uh, there's been several stores who have been buzzed by UAVs recently, and that makes big press. And it gets you know I don't want that happening. I don't want it happening in my home. But I, I guess what I'd like people to understand that I, I think the problem is we need to come out with rules and understandings about where you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. And it doesn't matter whether it's on a drone or on a kite or a satellite system or an autonomous car or a telephoto lens from a building or a street. It's really important that um, we have rules as a country about where you should have a reasonable expectation of privacy and where it's okay to take pictures and where, it, where it's not. And I don't think that it being on a drone or not is the issue. It's a question of are you allowed to take the picture and should you be pointing the camera though? Mm -hmm. And it's, is it enforceable when you establish that mm -hmm. limitation? Eric? And I, I think that the, the comments that Helen made before about deconfliction and, and figuring out the airspace questions um, around <laughs> drones is actually a, a big piece of this too. Like where can things fly? How can they fly? Uh, what are the, the baseline rules? But I think as we figure this out, I mean NASA's working on this with the UTM mm -hmm. project and I know that other companies have, uh, have put forth proposals on mm -hmm. how they think it should work. I, I think we do need to get in front of it. I mean, I think it's a this is a place where the U.S. has to have leadership so to actually enable the innovation for sure. Yeah. But I think that as we do that, we need to make sure that we're not, or that we think about the other things that will come soon after this too. So it's not just a narrow thing that fits drones as they exist today, but things that could exist tomorrow <laughs> that I'm pretty sure will exist tomorrow. How do we take that into account as we structure these regulations so that we're kind of a little bit more far-sighted instead of nearsighted? I have to say this is uh, this is like a classic technologist mind frame that you just said, <laughs> and this is what we I think this is what we don't have in the government, which is like you set a policy, you, your nirvana is the implementation of that policy, <laughs> and very rarely are you thinking yeah. thereafter. Yeah. But you're you're basically you're already thinking about what comes after you're successful in whatever it, mm -hmm. this vision is for personal aviation. You're already thinking about what comes next. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's basically what's marked this country. So. But I, I think there's also a really good point along with that that, um, uh, you know, that a role of regulation, for, for example, one thing the drones need to know is where the manned aircraft are. Right. Um, you know, we can all know where each other are. But yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I, the FAA, I believe, has said 2020 is when systems will come into place to have us know where right. the manned systems are because, you know, Quite frankly, we can land <laughs> yeah. and you know stay out of their way, but we have to know where they are. So there are rules for regulation uh, in this industry, and Fair. it might be ADSB, it might you know cell phones do a good job. You know, everyone has a GPS, you know, on their cell phone or in their car. We can know where everything is, and it's a really, really big airspace. We can deconflict it. <laughs> yeah, that's problem. Yeah, Anthony, I think you want the the most. Um, kind of poignant uh, concern that's that's been a uh, or risk that you've confronted as you've been working this and you know how you contextualize or understand that risk well I look I think um, we didn't have DOT available to us when the automobile was created um, or when the airplane for that matter was created and now we have a whole, a whole 50 year period of looking at safety through the lens of 50 years of experience I would say that there, there are three basic levels of risk. First, the industry is incentivized to be safe. We have to be confident that they can be, but I think there is a built-in uh, incentive for safety, and we have to listen to the industry as they um, come to us with new models for how to, how to look at that. Secondly, the users have to be clear on what they can and can't do. As innovation occurs, uh, people will be uh, encouraged or think that they can stretch the uses beyond what the manufacturer may have intended in the first place, and so users have to be very clear on what's what they can and can't do. And then for us, I think we have to we have to have an ongoing conversation in government that uh, continues to keep the future in the present tense. We have to keep thinking about how we need to build our competencies, how we need to build our regulatory approaches, how we need to build our open doors, so that we are continuing to evolve as the industry evolves. It's good. Actually, you know, I, I was going to say I'm not going to end on that because I thought I was leaving, uh, going to leave a bad taste in people's mouth. That's pretty good. <laughs> um, and so, look, I, I just finished uh, the Wright Brothers, the relatively new Wright Brothers biography. I'm usually about a year behind on books, but... Um, uh, Where did they first fly? Uh, 
I don't know. Oh, I am. <laughs> I was hurt. The North Carolina. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding you. I think I knew. Uh, and obviously, Eric knows something about that too. But uh, so does Helen. But it was a great book. It's uh, very inspiring. <laughs> yeah, you know those. That's gutsy. Yeah. When remember when he went up to Governor's Island on the second flight, mm. and all the journalists came in, and then the clouds came in. He said, "Well, I'm not going to fly." So the journalists split. And he just flew the next day, you know, up the river and back. And like maybe one or two journalists stuck around to see it, right? So that's the technologist, man. You just keep cranking away. So we appreciate this very much. And uh, I, again, I urge everybody to, to dial in on the um, Frontiers Conference on Thursday. Um, and I appreciate you guys coming in to, to do this. And uh, Anthony, I appreciate you coming across town. You got and uh, if you get stuck in traffic, just imagine there will be a tra transportation secretary pretty soon who, like the president, will hop in a personal aviation technology to get <laughs> him or herself back to the department. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.